Listen, thank you so much for taking the time uh, to talk to me. I really appreciate it. I wanted to start off just by, um, someone told me you once worked, did some work for the National Energy Board. Is that true? You did some work mm -hmm. consulting work for Canada? I did uh, visit the uh, Open Government Partnership uh, Summit. Uh, yeah. uh, that was 2019. Yeah. And at the time, I engaged in exchanges with many uh, Canadian government officials, okay. uh, including the, the NEB. Uh, and so, uh, I at that time, uh, we're, we were uh, sharing Taiwan's uh, open government experiences, open consultations, yeah. um, participation offices, and so on. Uh, and so, I engaged in exchanges. And okay. So uh, I didn't get paid. It's not consulting. Oh, it wasn't consulting work. Okay, I was curious. I was. I'm very interested in talking to you because uh, Taiwan um, is. Uh, there's a lot of concern in Canada about the future of Taiwan, and there's a lot of discussion about how prepared Taiwan is for uh, any kind of attack by China. And I wanted to start off just by asking you about something you talked about recently, which was the um, the less lessons you're taking from Ukraine. And this satellite trial program, uh, the, yes, the non-geostationary uh, satellites. Because I've talked to some of the um, military experts, and they say the first thing that China would do mm -hmm. would be to cut electric uh, internet cables, try to cut you off from the rest of the world. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. What are you doing to try to um, get around that? Mm -hmm. Yeah, we already have some capacity uh, in geostationary satellites. Uh, but the thing is that the bandwidth uh, is quite limited, mm -hmm. uh, and so the communication would be if you use only geostationary satellites, limited uh, to like uh, low fidelity video or just images and text. Okay. Uh, but as we have seen uh, from the Ukrainian experience, real time video conferencing is really important. Uh, that's what enabled uh, President Zelensky to, to speak to the world and for the entire world to know what's actually going on uh, so that rumors and disinformation uh, would not spread, right? Um, so because of that, <coughs> we've allocated uh, a proof of concept uh, project that will enlist uh, more than 700 uh, local uh, places uh, deemed of strategic uh, significance. So those 700 spots, uh, along with three uh, overseas spots, uh, will form the first uh, POC proof of concept uh, for the non-geostationary um, network configuration. So that uh, in these strategic uh, points, even if uh, the mobile network, or as you put it, uh, the like uh, marine cables and so on, um, got, got cut, <laughs> you still have uh, pretty good uh, video conferencing capabilities around uh, that we enable people uh, to not panic, of course, but also enable international friends to understand what's actually going on on the ground. Yeah, it really struck many people that if, if Zelensky mm -hmm. didn't have the means to communicate, mm -hmm. he would have lost right away. We, they, it was so important mm -hmm. when he did those first few videos from, yes. from Kiev, uh, yeah. showing the world that he was still there and showing mm -hmm. all his people that here's all my cabinet, we're all still mm -hmm. here. Like, that was mm -hmm. so important. And, and, and we need ammunition on the ride or something. Yeah, yeah, not a ride. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, it's, um, I, I, I'm, I was very intrigued to read about this because uh, uh, that is, I think that's a fundamental issue. Information is also war. Mm -hmm. Information is also part of war, right? Yeah, it's uh, part of the gray zone uh, activities, right? Mm -hmm. So even without, you know, a formal declaration of war and so on, um, already we face, um, Cyber attacks, we face disinformation, information manipulation campaigns yep. on a daily basis. I wanted to ask you, I read your hiring um, people, I'm not sure for what, but I was intrigued by when you said, mm -hmm. you know, diploma is not what you, we're not necessarily looking mm -hmm. for diplomas. What, mm -hmm. what are you looking for? Um, so, especially in my field, uh, computer science uh, and information uh, science, uh, what, what's more important is the portfolio like how much uh, large architecturing systems you have engaged with. Do you have uh, prior records in the free software, uh, open source communities, and so on. And in the cybersecurity field, uh, instead of diploma, uh, they have like CVEs, right, to their name. Uh, they right. have uh, actual contributions uh, to the cybersecurity. They may have won um, the, the capture the flag, right, in DEF CON and so on. And, and all of these awards uh, and certificates and open source contributions mm -hmm. and so on. Um, I, I didn't say that uh, diploma is not valued. I, I say uh, these contributions counts uh, as diploma uh, when we talk about salary. 
because previously uh, in the public sector, the salary is almost entirely determined uh, by um, the, the diploma level. So there's, uh, it's very difficult for someone who's a high school dropout like me uh, to earn the same level of salary as a PhD uh, in public sector. Mm -hmm. uh, but if I can demonstrate that I have uh, these years of contributions, these certificates, mm -hmm. uh, won these awards, filed these CVEs and yeah. so on, then it counts as PhDs. That's the basic idea for the salary. And what will these people be doing? What's their, mm -hmm. what, what, why are you hiring people mm -hmm. and how many are you hiring? Mm -hmm. Sure. Uh, so, um, Till the end of next year, uh, we'll have around 600 people, uh, 598 to be precise, uh, and still uh, around 85% or more uh, will be career public service. Uh, so only less than 100, say 80, 90 or so uh, people will be uh, external recruits. Uh, and these recruits uh, are important because there are certain disciplines uh, within uh, the public sector that was not uh, yet uh, evaluated by the examination uh, mm -hmm. the, the branch uh, for examination for public service. So the kind of cybersecurity experts, as I mentioned, uh, the kind of information architecture uh, and also service design. And these are the important disciplines if we are going to uh, re factor the existing public service so it's more resilient. Uh, and so, uh, of course, the, the mid to long term goal is to work with the examination yuan so that these uh, very important disciplines are folded back uh, into the examination structure, uh, which will require more than like paper uh, answering exercises. It may actually involve like red team, uh, blue team, <laughs> like actual, actual uh, exercises. But at, at this moment, the examination yuan is not yet uh, recruiting these disciplines using the kind of examination structure uh, okay. we would like. Uh, and so these like 80, 90 people to end of next year uh, will be the first batch that uh, reach with the uh, great public service so we can determine okay. together the examination structure. And those 80 to 90 people, what would their jobs be then? Mm -hmm. what, will, what will their jobs be? Uh, so um, information uh, architecture, cybersecurity yeah. architecture, Protect service design architecture, and so on. Yeah, uh, and um, all three uh, of our units, the MODA proper, uh, the administration for digital industries mm -hmm. and the administration uh, for cybersecurity uh, will be recruiting from external sources. It's been said that Taiwan is on the front lines of disinformation. Mm -hmm. You are, uh, this is where the China is uh, heavily targeting people. Mm -hmm. um, can you, I don't think Canadians really understand how serious this is. Can you give me some examples of what is going on that might surprise North Americans? Well, for example, um, leading to our 2020 election, there was a trending disinformation, really trending, that said uh, the people protesting in Hong Kong, the young people, uh, they're actually uh, being paid. Uh, and for each police they murder, uh, they collect uh, $200,000. Uh, $200, so, um, and, and this is not just like this single uh, line of caption, uh, there are scary looking photos, uh, doctored footages and things like that to back this up. Uh, interestingly, uh, this is very precise because the same uh, disinformation doesn't spread in Hong Kong at all. Hmm. Uh, so this is just targeting the, the Taiwanese population. The reason why is that that's, uh, everybody can see, going to be the deciding factor for the 2020 presidential election, the Hong Kong experience, right? right? And the so-called one country, two system uh, perception. And there was fake documents and fake evidence too. Right, and, and the, the photo looks quite high quality and so on because it's a Reuters photo. Uh, but if you look at the Reuters uh, report, it only said that there are young people in Hong Kong right? yeah. <laughs> protesting. So, so the narrative was reframed. Yeah. Uh, and so in order to combat this kind of disinformation, we rely on the volunteers to flag uh, what's trending mm -hmm. uh, in even end-to-end -end encrypted channels. So the state doesn't have visibility to those uh, like WhatsApp, right, line message groups. Mm -hmm. uh, but everyone can just like flagging an email as fine, uh, flag something as potential disinformation. And send it to who? And send it to co-facts. That's the collaborative fact-checking ecosystem. Mm -hmm. It's a civil society organization like Wikipedia, organized by G0V or Gov0, uh, yes. civil society movements. Uh, and they partner 
uh, with, for example, uh, Trend Micro, which is our leading antivirus company, uh, or Google Look, uh, the um, company that uh, does the Who's Call, which is uh, blocking unsolicited calls and so on. So there's also private sector. So the private sector and the social sector uh, shares, just like uh, counter spam, right? Counter spam, you have Hotmail and Gmail yeah. and so on, sharing with spam house. Yeah. So the same uh, configuration buffer this information. So uh, somebody in, in the embassy in Ottawa said <clears throat> there's also a rapid response team. Yes. Maybe it was the ambassador. Can mm -hmm. you just explain the, because he said, for instance, if you're, you see something, you can send it online. Yep like your line service, mm -hmm. and the government has a person mm -hmm. designated in every department to answer questions. Yes. Can you explain how that works? Because that's sure. fascinating. Sure. So uh, in, in the case that I just mentioned, um, it's the independent fact checkers, journalists, yeah. time fact check center, and so Michael Penn, and so on, rumor and truth, uh, many uh, fact checkers uh, who investigate what's going on. And if they require a response uh, immediately from any of our ministries, uh, there's a designated liaisons uh, for them to, to inquire. Now, um, they actually independently investigated to find the narrative originates from the Zhongyang Zhengfa Wei Chang'an Jian, the Chang'an Sword Weibo account of the Central Political and Law Unit uh, uh, from the CCP, from the mm -hmm. Communist Party in Beijing. Um, and so the, the photo is Reuters, but the caption came from that Weibo account. Right. <clears throat> and the journalist who fact-checked uh, posted online so that um, uh, line, pun not intended, mm -hmm. and Facebook and so on uh, actually gets this notice and public notice uh, shared database. Yeah. So the next time people share it online or on Facebook and so on, uh, they can see this label uh, that says, uh, well, the, the information that you just shared is probably sponsored by the CCP or something oh, like that. Right? So, so click here to learn more. Right. right. So none of this uh, is takedown. We don't do takedowns. Uh, we don't do censorship. Uh, but it re-established the context to enable, really to, to enable people to build a kind of vaccine of the mind. So, but if there's a response necessary from the government, there's yeah. someone there to, to put out a response. How does that yeah. response get disseminated? How does the government sure. response get transmitted? Sure. So uh, there was uh, in early 2020 another piece of disinformation uh, mm -hmm. that says uh, we're going to run out of uh, toilet paper soon. And the reason why was that we started rationing out medical grade masks. Uh, and so uh, the disinformation says that all the toilet paper is going to be confiscated to make masks. Uh, of course, that's not true. Not, not the same material. No, you know, no. plastic paper. No. <laughs> right? Not the same material. Uh, but uh, I mean, uh, at the time, the main disinformation attacks was around getting people to panic buy. So when people do go to panic buy, uh, there's kind of photographic evidence that people are uh, panic buying and so on. And that gets amplified by the disinformation operators uh, to say that essentially only authoritarian uh, states can counter the pandemic and democratic states, you know, are chaotic uh, and so on. So that's part of the, the narrative. Uh, and when we detected that, um, the premier's office uh, worked with Ministry of Health and Welfare and so on. So that this liaison group uh, is charged to send out within two hours two pictures, each with 200 characters or less, uh, mimetic pictures uh, to counter the disinformation uh, that must have a higher basic reproduction number that goes more viral um, mm -hmm. than the disinformation. Uh, and in that particular case, it was the premier um, wiggling his bottoms uh, with very large form that says, um, um, each of us only have a pair of bottoms. Now, now, this is a uh, wordplay because uh, to stockpile twin yeah. sounds the same as bottom twin. Uh, oh, okay. And so, um, and, and there's this table uh, in the yeah. meme uh, that says, you know, plastic paper, uh, yes. like domestic sources, South American sources, not the same. Uh, but if it's just this paper, yeah. uh, like a table, it will not spread more than the disinformation. But coupled uh, with this caption that's styled, humor, yeah. humor that's styled after uh, we only have one earth. Right, and it was just first changed to bottom. Uh, it, it's it, it's viral, and it was the, the premier's picture, right? So um, when people look at this picture, laughed about it, it took this kind of sense of outrage away. Yeah. So when they encounter the disinformation again, they would be in the mood uh, to to talk about it in a more calm uh, fashion, right? Uh, and not getting outraged and then share and then panic by themselves. 
so the panic buy was solved uh, within a couple of days uh, because this uh, variant yeah. spreads faster. That's very yeah. interesting. Uh -huh. Yeah, I wanted to just go back to Ukraine because I also sure. had read when you talked to other newspapers or media mm -hmm. that you're trying to learn from Ukraine's messaging style. Humor, not rumor, is what you said. Can you, is that the same thing as what you're talking about here, pretty much? Yeah, yeah. The, the, the humor, to use humor to counter rumor, right? Yeah. Uh, humor over rumor. Uh, for the Ukrainian case, uh, even my grandma, 90 years old, asked me, uh, and I go, was it true that a uh, old grandmother in Kiev shot down uh, a drone uh, using a can of cucumbers? Uh, and, and, uh, and I was like, well, according to fact checkers, there's a can of tomatoes. <laughs> but I was correct. But, but I mean, it's very really serious, it's painful, and so on. Uh, but the messaging uh, that's around these, like the ghosts of Kiev and so on, yeah. uh, really puts uh, people in the mood of, uh, of course, still concerned about the war, but also are more at ease uh, to share information yeah. about the war. Well, the ghosts of Kiev was fake, though, right? That was mm -hmm. the whole, was Yeah, that? it was a, a concentrated narrative. Yeah, right? but it was actually a government narrative, I mm -hmm. guess, in that way, right? Mm -hmm. You um, you are, uh, I wanted to ask you about Taiwan as a progressive country. Um, I don't think many Canadians know that Taiwan was the first country to legalize same-sex marriage mm -hmm. in Asia. Yeah. Um, but I wanted to ask you about the extent to which Taiwan's shift um, on the progressive spectrum is further distinguishing it from the PRC. Mm -hmm. I mean, I assume that's another way that you're moving farther apart. Mm -hmm. I mean, uh, I don't know what China's attitude is towards same-sex marriage, uh, but it's certainly not. Well, in the recent years, uh, and, yeah. <laughs> uh, have they or have they? Oh. You, you, I was wondering, um, why do you think Taiwan is more progressive than other Asian countries? Mm -hmm. Well, I, I think um, that's be partly because we're a young democracy. Uh, and so we have this sense uh, that democracy itself is a kind of technology a social technology that people can contribute and make better. So instead of like hundreds of years of a particular tradition uh, to uh, practice democracy, uh, we have not just uh, the votes and referendums, but also citizens' petitions, participatory budgets, presidential hackathon, sandbox experiments, all, all sorts of different ways uh, to engage people on a day-to-day -day basis so that even people younger than 18 have a lot of room uh, to voice their concerns uh, and effect real policy change. Now, <coughs> uh, on the national petition platform, um, actually a lot of the very successful petitions came from people younger than 18 who have this very progressive vision. Uh, and the platform allows them to build solidarity with people in their 70s or like my grandma and in their 90s. Uh, and <coughs> because both um, age bracket have more time on their hands <laughs> and also yeah. care more about the long-term progress, right? Yeah. Um, and so <clears throat> including like the, the banning of the plastic straw in our national train property takeouts yeah. uh, and also um, getting uh, people uh, to see that referendums are important, but the indigenous rights and other minorities and so on should not be put into referendum and so on. So all these debates are happening even before they are of age to vote. Mm -hmm. <coughs> and so I think this shapes the narrative into something like a faster iteration. Uh, that is to say, we, we get marriage equality, well, not everybody was happy about it, uh, but then uh, people collectively think about what's making people unhappy. Uh, turns out it's the kind of kinship, uh, patriarchal Confucian um, tradition. Uh, and so the exact way that we legalize marriage equality was that we only legalized the individual to individual marriage, uh, the, the bylaws, but not the family to family kinship, not the in laws, okay. like mother in law, father in law. Sure. Right. So, uh, and then this uh, made people like there's a rough consensus, good enough consensus, uh, that this protects the rights and duties of individuals, but it doesn't hurt the, the Confucian uh, patriarchal relationship. And so, this kind of uh, capability to make a high bandwidth conversation to build good enough consensus and compromise despite the initial differences. I think that's what makes us progress uh, more effectively and in a more agile fashion. More agile. Um, do you think it's important or significant that you are becoming, this is changing Taiwan mm -hmm. and making it even less like the PRC? Mm -hmm. I mean, people here talk about how China and Taiwan mm -hmm. have a shared background, a shared cultural history mm -hmm. and so on. but. You are also becoming more different. Is that is that important? 
Well, I, I don't know whether we do this just to be different. I mean, um, d- during the pandemic, right? Uh, we yeah. we didn't do lockdowns, but that's not because uh, we want to be different from the PRC. Yeah. That's because we want to be different on how we handle SARS <laughs> in 2003, which did involve a very painful lockdown of the Hoping Hospital. <clears throat> so uh, I think the, the option is that if the state does uh, top-down, shutdown, lockdowns, and so on, takedowns, uh, it takes away the civil society uh, capabilities. And any authoritarian regime uh, will probably evolve to a point uh, where, for example, journalistic insight uh, is decimated uh, and the rulers or leaders do not have the full picture of what's actually going on in the field. But in Taiwan, because we practice um, that we're a very open society, so naturally we evolve and progress toward uh, what's actually um, matters, what actually counters the pandemic, uh, what sort of um, disinformation countering uh, mechanism actually work. Right? We're, we're very um, agile in the sense that we give up whatever playbooks that's not working uh, and so on. And so it means that at this moment we're um, moving toward uh, the entire democratic world in terms of how to counter this information, how to yeah. um, how to counter the pandemic, and so on. Uh, while the PRC, of course, mm. um, chose uh, the, the the same way, right? Uh, as of this month, uh, as last month. So uh, I don't think it's us deliberately moving away. I think it's just a natural progression of being a open civil society. Right. And um, are you saying there was no lockdowns here mm-hmm. ever? For the past two and a half years, we've never had a single day of lockdown. Interesting. Uh, okay. Yeah. And that was a conscious decision because you didn't want lockdowns? As it was a government? conscious decision. It's like no lockdown at all costs. Because you think it's um, a step towards authoritarianism or? That's, that's one. Uh, and also, as I mentioned in 2003, uh, there was a painful unannounced lockdown of the Hoping Hospital. Oh. So it was traumatic. Inside uh, the hospital. Inside the hospital. Uh, and uh, what we're uh, looking at is the CECC, the Central Epidemic Command Center. It was designed uh, explicitly so that we can react early mm-hmm. uh, and we can do this uh, in a way that respects the civil society's demand for human rights. And so yeah. On. Right. So uh, if we go back to lockdown, it's as if that the mechanism we designed right after SARS didn't work. Right? Yeah. So, so there's a lot of pride in this. My point about you becoming more different from China was the only reason I made that point was yeah. as China continues to argue that Taiwan is a province of China mm-hmm. and that it should be reunited one day, mm-hmm. it seems even less likely that the people would accept such a thing because mm-hmm. their society has transformed and grown mm-hmm. so different. I mean, for between, 40, between 49 and, and I guess when uh, the late 80s, you mm-hmm. were under martial law. Mm-hmm. So in the eyes of the West, you know, you're authoritarian just like Taiwan, mm-hmm. just like China, but you've moved steadily away from that. You've become far different. So it's it seems it's interesting to me because it seems that it would be even less likely that, that people who've experienced these things would ever want to live under a PRC. When, when was the last time PRC and Taiwan was united? But what I mean is, it's it's you're becoming even more different. Exactly, right? exactly. So, uh, and and I think uh, this is um, a, a conscious uh, decision uh, by the CECC and so on, uh, because as you said, the PRC was a prominent example uh, at like, and I quote, only lockdowns um, can fix the pandemic. End of quote. Right. Uh, but uh, we're very conscious to build a model that will also enable economic growth. Uh, and without undue human rights restrictions. Mm-hmm. Uh, and I, um, a, a few months ago, talked to uh, some local public servants and CSOs in the UK, and they're like, yeah, Taiwan is just too different so that you can put this to work. I'm like, well, if you don't call it Taiwan model, call it New Zealand model, yeah. because New Zealand also proved that it could work. So it's all about uh, investing uh, in the capabilities of resilience before the pandemic, because for people who have uh, used these mechanisms before the pandemic, uh, the learning curve is more more mellow. Uh, but if you do not have such infrastructures in place and habits in place before the pandemic, getting people to change the habit itself, of course, takes time. I want to ask you two more things. One is, sure. what are the main... There must be... You must be able to categorize the type of disinformation campaign that mm-hmm. the PRC is waging. Like, for instance, you can't trust the US or, you know, this is just a war between the U.S. and China. What are the main messages they seek to 
see oh, the, the main message Taiwan. is simple democracy doesn't work okay yeah that's the, the main yeah, message democracy all, always lead to chaos democracy cannot counter the pandemic uh democracy cannot even run an election properly and, and so on right so uh, it's not about pro or con any point it's not about pro or contra any political party it's not about pro or contra any leadership and so on it's about uh sabotaging uh people's uh belief and faith yeah. in the democratic process itself uh, because that's the only way that the uh, um, annexation right the authoritarian yeah. leads to better life uh, that's the only way that those narratives could win can I ask you, what are the main methods that they use? Is it YouTube and TikTok? Are those the ones these days? Or what is the, the main social media they use? Well, the earlier uh, signals uh, still almost always come from online uh, groups. Okay. Uh, because it's uh, precise targeting. It's end-to-end -end encrypted. The search engine doesn't see those. Okay. Right. So, which is why the early warning system, almost like contact tracing system, um, were built uh, upon the people's uh, voluntarily flagging of this information from the line channels. Usually, the line channels leads uh, TikTok or YouTube by, to by, yeah, by, yeah. by half a day or a day or, or so on. So, it's like a, a kind of brewing ground. Uh, the kind of message that uh, organically spread in line mm -hmm. uh, tends to find its way uh, into TikTok and YouTube and other channels and Facebook and so on. Uh, and if it doesn't uh, pan out uh, in the line groups, then it's not worth investing uh, for the information and creators. Can I just ask you about the word resilience? I mm -hmm. see that this moda is described as to, to help build resilience. Can you mm -hmm. just explain in plain language what that sure. means? Sure, sure. So resilience means um, to not just recover. Uh, from an adversity, but actually transform so that we build back better uh, and uh, to anticipate uh, future threats and adversity. So, for example, uh, after SARS, when you establish the CECC and the entire mechanism to counter uh, the, the disease, right? it's resilience. It's not just recovering from SARS, but protecting against any future virus that looks like SARS. So that's resilience. And so you talked about being a young democracy, and, mm -hmm. and uh, I guess what we would count democracy from ninety six, from nineteen ninety six. Is that the beginning? Is that the, it's the first direct presidential election? Okay. Yeah. So one of the sort of you mentioned a bunch of experimental mm -hmm. uh, mechanisms you use that mm -hmm. I'm not familiar with. So sure. you mentioned referenda, you mentioned mm -hmm. a hackathon, and so yeah, on, and citizen petitions. Can you explain just sure. briefly how those are used? Because we've seen those in the U.S., but they seem mm -hmm. to the, the American population doesn't seem to be excited about them anymore, but I'm, I'm interested that you are excited about them. Yeah, I am. I, totally yeah. Um, I mean, the, the way that we built the mask uh, visibility map is itself like a three-day hackathon, uh, where the citizens initiated the idea that instead of queuing in line and then the pharmacy runs out of masks, um, and anyone can contribute using their phone uh, to look at which pharmacy nearby still have some uh, mask in stock. Mm -hmm. And the thing is that the citizens built it before the state uh, rely on uh, Ushahidi like uh, reporting mechanisms. Uh, but when we uh, look at these ideas, instead of saying that oh, we'll just nationalize the platform, we instead said oh, what kind of high quality data they may want, uh, we will just provide. So in early 2020, we provided on a 30 second uh, resolution, meaning that it's updated twice a minute. Mm -hmm. um, the, when you're queuing in line, you can actually see uh, the person queuing before you uh, purchased how many masks and so on. Uh, and so there's no panic because people can always navigate to the places nearby that still have some medical grade mask available. So you help the private initiative get mm -hmm. better data on what Yeah, and, and more than 100 different applications were built. Some tailoring to people comfortable with maps, but for people with seeing difficulties, voice assistance, or chatbots, and so on. So the point here is not uh, choosing one or two teams to, to procure a solution. Yeah. I call it reverse procurement, right? It's the civil society demanding uh, what kind of data to be released, and we work with them so to enable more than 100 teams. Oh, really interesting. That's very interesting. Can I ask you, uh, your. Oh, sorry. Uh, yeah, well, we will have to move because I have to swear into office. Okay. Uh, so, so you have one last question. Yeah, maybe? just about being transgender and being yeah. a transgender cabinet minister. 
I'm wondering what's your experience like and is it something that, uh, mm -hmm. I mean, you are a trailblazer in that way and mm -hmm. many people uh, take note of that. Can you say mm -hmm. what, it, what it was like to be the first transgender or openly transgender mm -hmm. cabinet minister in Taiwan? I'm very proud to say I've never faced discrimination in the past six years sure. just because I'm transgender. I mean, people question my political affiliation and I secretly a member of any party and so on, uh, which seems to, to be okay nowadays. People understand I'm truly nonpartisan. Uh, oh, yeah. but, but, yeah. oh, I thought you'd be DPP. But you're no, not. I, I'm non-binary, not just in gender. <laughs> That's really interesting. Okay. Yeah. So, so the, the point I'm making is that uh, I get more and more flack uh, early on uh, due to my perceived like PPV connection or KMT connection uh, compared to my gender. Nobody really uh, gives me any anything uh, discriminatory because of my gender. Oh, you're swearing in right now. That's great. Congratulations. Thank you. Um, <clears throat> really good to meet you. I know you got a Ronald. Can you take a quick picture? Sure, sure. Uh, um,